the coolness now that we're back in the sanctuary this morning. We are part of the United Church of Christ. We are a loving congregation. We are part of a congregation that is lifting their voice as an alternative vision of what church can and should be. So welcome. Welcome you with your hurts, you with your longings, you with your dreams, you with all your love. Let us begin worship. I'm Claudia Dennis, and I'm the religious this morning. I invite you to stand as you are able and join me in the call of worship. Sing praise to God who changes our morning into dancing. Sing praise to Christ who offers healing for our sickness. Sing praise to the Spirit who brings peace to our turmoil. Let us enter into our time of worship. Let us open ourselves to the Spirit. Lord, we come to you as pilgrims on a journey, seeking comfort and communion in your presence. Be today both our host and our guest and a place of rest upon our way. Amen. Here. The word of God. 
there have always been those few rare individuals who have accepted the call to go forth and move the world toward a better vision, toward inclusion, compassion, <coughs> equity, justice, freedom, and self-respect. What is so remarkable is that these people who take on these tasks are usually pretty unremarkable themselves. I mean, many times these are unlettered people, some lacking in sophistication, but on fire for a cause of helping us all to be more human. Bands of, we could call them disciples, who speak with a singular intention, calling on each of us to recognize the need for equal education, for civil rights, equal pay for women, caring for the poor, workers' rights, protecting children, advocating for peace, dismantling the prison industrial complex, protecting the earth. These are the ones who work to bring a new vision of what life can be, let's say like ushering in a new kingdom. And these public prophets, these disciples, usually just do the work without the constraints of institutional protocol or caring for big buildings. They go and they speak to the people, they organize the people, they inspire and care for the people, and they travel very light. For that type of work demands constant movement and a certain type of freedom. These are the people who shake up the world from the bottom up in halls, in homes, in schools, and in churches. And this prophetic task always brings us to new breakthroughs. Nothing stays the same after a new vision is articulated, advocated for, and won. You know, the idea that all men and women are created equal, or that peace is possible, or that workers have the right to organize, that we can be stewards of the earth and not just parasites. One of my favorite authors is Jones Chitteser, and she says, every time we shine a light into the darkness, and people begin to see the injustice, the intolerance, the bigotry, the greed, and the abuses of power. We inch a little toward what God would have us be. When the everyday prophet speaks, creation takes another leap forward and the vision of God becomes present again through the efforts of ordinary people. People who look at the world and are compelled to expand its capacity. Like the disciples, ordinary people, a fisherman, a, a net vendor, a tax collector. Which brings me to this morning's text. This text is about a band of disciples obtaining obstructions from Jesus on how to go forth into the world. Sharing his vision of what the world could be like. Sharing his vision of what a real kingdom looks like when its operating principles are justice and peace. Sharing his vision about caring for the least of us loving people across borders, even across the pain of history. In today's text, Jesus is telling them how to interact with people in love in a way that liberates and heals. Notice, as he's sending them out and organizing these 70 people to do this important task, there's no board of directors. There, there's no building fund. There's not even a focus group. Just go forth in faith with a companion. The disciples are instructed not to pack any bags 
or make any reservations. They go forth equipped only with the gospel and the hope of hospitality. They are told whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. This is important because Jesus doesn't ask them to do any assessment before making this proclamation. He doesn't ask them to determine whether this house follows God at all. Whether this house follows the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Or he doesn't ask them if those people kept the law. Or do they even want to hear the good news? He doesn't ask them to make a pre-assessment or pre-judge whether this house will be worth their time. This is the peace that they bring. It is not the peace won on the backs of soldiers and military might. It is not a peace reserved for the wealthy at the expense of the poor. Not a peace brought forth through destruction and death. No, the peace that they bring is a peace of inclusion and welcome and of new life. The amazing thing is that he sends 70 people out in the world on this radical mission without a fundraiser. <laughs> I mean, not even, they were fishermen, not even a fish fry. <laughs> No way of supporting themselves, no purse, no supplies, not even an extra pair of sandals. And then he talks about the cities and homes that will welcome them and about those that will not. Why would he ask them to do something so difficult? Why would anybody ask people to travel with a revolutionary message without funds or lodging? Traveling just to bring a word of peace. Bringing a spirit of resistance with them to the powers and principalities of darkness. Knowing that there will be those who will be advocating we got to keep our borders safe, knowing they will encounter those who will be so proud to revel in the military might of the empire, knowing that there will be those who will reject their cause for inclusion and compassion. I believe he sent the 70 out to join people who travel themselves without resources. To live as one of them, whether it is to seek asylum or escape. There's always people on the world traveling like this, you know. Then and now. And then and now, sometimes they're met with hospitality and sometimes they're met with hostility. And now, these 70 people with this radical message, they're required to be one of those people. One of those people just traveling that could be a migrant, that could be seen as a threat, except for they know that they're coming to bring a word of hope, a word of revolution. So they are required to do this work, to go in the world being completely vulnerable as they encounter people their vulnerability. These are not missionaries seeking to convert for the sake of expansion of the empire. This is a very different mission. These are the disciples of one who had begun a radical religious movement that threatened the status quo, that dared to critique both the empire and the synagogue. The climate is people are being taxed to death by the government and the ritual and purity laws of their 
faith is doing more harm than good. So he just sends them out. Be totally vulnerable. Just like the people that they will encounter on the road. And they depend on those they meet along the way to meet the physical needs for shelter, food, and safety. The disciples now have to rely on the grace and provision of God to take care of them in their journey. Why? Well, I believe because of two things. One, if you're that vulnerable, you have to rely on your faith. I think Dr. King said that faith is relying that there's a stair staircase there even when you can't see the stairs. And also, walking in faith develops courage. Last month, I quoted Teddy Roosevelt when he said, on courage, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error or shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least, he fails daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know no victory or defeat. That's what Jesus is asking them to do, to stand in the arena of their convictions with great enthusiasm to know both triumph and defeat, to know welcome and rejection, to understand that everybody will not welcome you, but your critics do not define you. He is asking them to dare greatly to go forth with this message. And then when your face is covered with dust and maybe even a little blood, he says to them, just shake the dust from your sandals and keep it moving. Because that's how courage is developed. And here we glimpse the wisdom of this most outrageous request. Because this, this Jesus movement takes on a courage that comes out of vulnerability, not military might. That was the confusion about his message. They wanted him to take over and kick some Roman behind. But this, this was a different kind of warfare. Developing people's courage from the inside, their inner core. A courage born of openness to rejection and the strength to be gracious in the face of that uncertainty. These commissioned ones are asked to fully depend on the hospitality of strangers. This is very important because in the ancient mind they understood the implications of hospitality. Throughout scripture it's clear the real quality of a people is revealed on how they welcome travelers without resources. According to the ancient prophets, the depravity of the city of Sodom showed itself in their refusal to offer hospitality to the travelers who came to them needing shelter. Instead of feeding them and welcoming them or protecting them, 
They demanded, let us gain weight them. I think the connections to the problems we are currently facing is obvious. For this supposedly Christian nation who has houses of worship in every neighborhood, in every city, in every town, when strangers are showing up on our shores, but we don't demand to gain rape them. I mean, we're much too civilized for that. We just handcuff them. We just put their children in cages, away from their parents, and just sigh <sighs> as another one of them dies. Like Sodom, we're showing our depravity. Now, you and I know that these are deep and tangled issues that go along with trying to solve this problem. Thoughtful people on all sides of this issue know this and still commit to search for a solution. All of that is true, but what is also true is that Jesus and the prophets are clear on this point. That the quality of a people is revealed by how they welcome travelers without resources. And here, those commissioned to go forth with the message of Jesus are asked to stand in that space and be one of those people. He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs before wolves. There have always been those rare individuals who have accepted the call to go forth and move the world toward a better vision, to move the world toward inclusion, compassion, equity, justice, freedom, and self-respect. So the question before us is, will you do it? Would you dare to go ahead of Jesus with nothing but your spirit and a companion and talk to those you encounter about how different the world could be if we looked past celebrity, if we looked past political alliance, if we looked past this earthly realm, and if we acknowledge the power more powerful than Facebook, more powerful than silver and gold, or even news networks, just to bring the good news, knowing that there are people and places that are going to reject you. Would you dare to become one of the proverbial 70? Telling the world who you know is longing for meaning, longing for hope. We come here because we dare to shine a light in all this darkness. We come because we want to help move this world one little inch towards the kingdom of God. So friends, the good news is we all have the opportunity to be modern disciples, everyday prophets, to call out injustice and invisibility of every kind. I pray that we will develop the courage to do so. Amen. With what shall we journey in faith? Not with bags or sandals. Nor with rituals or rules. No, but with blessings of peace. With prayers of healing for all who are willing to serve. With peace, 
mercy, love, and healing. We are ready to journey with God. Kia Yezu is a prayer part of the Catholic Mass for the dead. Um, Kia Yezu, Holy Jesus, Dominate Lord. Give them rest. Donna A is right in. And this repeats over and over again. Donna, give, give like a child begging. And to me, I'm begging for rest and for peace for those in cages who are refugees, for those suffering from the systemic white supremacy, for people grieving. Give them rest. Sent eternal, eternal, forever, always.
adding just a little bit of the good news to inch us a little closer toward what God would have us be. May the love of God surround you, the peace of God dwell in you, and the justice of God compel you. Go in peace.